Amen. Well, I'm excited to get into God's Word here this morning. You know, the Metro Coast sounds alive and well. It sounds fired up for Jesus. Amen. You know, I, I, I was thinking of what, what should be preached on a Sunday morning for the Metro Coast disciples and the Metro Coast family. And uh, I, I think everything, it's been such an awesome year so far. I mean, God has truly shown his glory within the Metro Coast. Hello, what do we need? Well, we got to talk over here in 1 Corinthians 13. Good old time in the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 13. Let's get an amen when you guys get there. Amen. The run-up to this is such an incredible passage as Paul is writing to the church in Corinth here. And as he's writing, he's just depicting in chapter 12 here how every part of the body matters. That you can't do away with certain parts just because they don't seem like they're as useful. And you can't, you know, you don't want to be part, another part of the body that you are not fit to be. And then he goes in to describe the different roles and positions within the church. And he says, you know what? All these things are going to pass away. All these things won't matter. And we jump in here to chapter 13 and verse 1. He says, what matters most? And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And the Metro Co. said, Amen. you know, this passage of scripture just convicted all of our socks off right there. Some of us a little bit more on the prideful side said, I'm not struggling. I, I'm, I'm good at all those. But the reality is, is this passage of scripture, this chapter here can really put you on the edge of your seat. You look, if you're married, you look to your partner, you said, well, I hope I'm doing all of these. Which one am I? You just look slowly at your wife or husband. You just, am I doing them all? Really the husbands to the wives, amen. But here this passage of scripture is depicting what Paul would say Hey, you may not have the role that you want in the church. You may not be the part of body you want to be. But let me show you, even if you don't have all that, what you do possess is the number one thing that matters. It's the most excellent way. And that's the title of my lesson today, The Most Excellent Way. He says if you don't possess that, if you don't have that what you want, you don't, are not in the position you want to be in, let me tell you what you do have. You have love. He says, you know what, say if you didn't get those positions, okay, we dealt with that. But even if you did have all you did want, if you had the, you could speak different dialects, even a dialect of an angel, speaking in exaggeration here. He says, if, 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 I'm, if, I'm, if I can move mountains with my faith, but have not love, is nothing. If I can produce and change everything around me and all these different things. And he's just going on and on. He says, but if you have all that, but you don't have love, all of it comes to nothing anyways. I think for us this morning, we need to talk about love. Such a sweet topic. Sounds so nice. Sounds so sweet. Sounds so soft. It's the most challenging thing in our lives. <laughs> I got three points for us here this morning. Three things we've got to love if we want to make it in this life. We want to make it the next 77 days that are left in this year. What is it going to take? Se yes, 77 days. This year has flown by. But if we want to make it, we made it this far. If we want to make it all the way to the end, it's going to take us walking the most excellent way. 
Point number one, first and foremost, we've got to love God. Look over here at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. You guys there? Almost. Amen, Ole. All right. All right, Ole. We got you. We're just waiting on Ole. Stalling for him, you know? That's how you love your brother right there, amen? We'll talk about that later. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says here in verse 1, These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to, to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy long life. Now I hope you're ready to enjoy a long life here because the Bible is about to teach us how. It says, hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord your the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. You know, this passage of scripture is so powerful. As the book of Deuteronomy, we understand, is Moses' application of the law. And so what he's trying to impress upon the people of God as they're preparing them and giving them the establishment and foundation so that when they enter the promised land, the land that was promised to their forefathers, they would not forget God in the process. They would not lose sight of what God wanted to do with them and the fact that he, Jehovah, is their God and that they would be his people. He says, before I get into the commands, let me give you the top priority of being my people. He says, love the Lord your God. He then describes how. He says, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. You know, the book of Deuteronomy, in fact, this very passage of scripture is referenced in Matthew 22 to talk about the greatest command as the religious leaders tried to test Jesus, which you just don't test Jesus. I mean, what, what are you thinking? But majority of the book, uh, of, the, of the gospels, the references of scriptures are coming from the book of Deuteronomy. In fact, when Satan tries to test Jesus, he references all throughout the book of Deuteronomy to help them to see that he is the one like Moses that would be amongst them like one of their brothers to show them this is from God's word. But he gives them the top command to be upheld. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and strength. You know, I think this is uh, such an incredible passage of scripture. I studied this out, and it talks about three things we love God with. He first starts off with, your heart. It says, when you love God with all your heart, you're loving God from what's within you. What's inside of you. This would be your desires, your passions, your affections, your perceptions, and thoughts. And ensuring that all of them are aligned with a love for God. You see, the loyalty to God, the love for God, it begins within. It begins in your heart. He then goes on to say, you got to love God with all your soul. And some may be, well, isn't your soul and your heart kind of connected? It is. But see, G what, what Moses was calling the people to was something much greater than just their heart. He was calling them to love God with their passions, with their hungers, with their perceptions and thoughts. But also how we talk with our hands, what we do with our hands, our work, our walk how we utilize our talents, how we react to different challenges, which is where we get the scriptures out of the overflow of the heart. 
the mouth speaks. Showing us that what's in our soul comes out within our circumstance. It says, love God with your entire being. This is how we know the separation between those who claim to love God and those who actually love God. It's obvious. He then goes on to say, with all of your strength. The meaning here, different translations will say all your might. But this translation says all your strength. Now, might and strength are pretty synonymous here. But typically what this is utilized as is an adverb. It's the word very that it translates to. And it's used 298 times within the Old Testament. The noun version of this actually appears only one other time in the book of Deuteronomy. And here it's being described as very. It's the way God wants you to worship. God wants you to love him. But he says here that you got to love God with your veriness. Is that what the scriptures say? With your very, what does it mean when it says your veriness? Well, different translations, if you translate this word to the Greek, it means power. If you translate it to the Aramaic, it means wealth. And so these are actually going into the same direction. It would be to worship God with all your resources. All that you have, all that you possess, everything you've got. So what is God saying? Worship me, love me with all of your time, your talent, and your treasures. This describes what is called a crazy love. I mean, you got to be a fanatic to love somebody in this way. I mean, here's the thing. When you're in preschool, this is how you love. Because you don't know how to love any other ways. You know, people talk about cooties, but when, you, when you're just crazy in love with somebody, you want those cooties. You're like, man, I want the cooties of loving that person right there. And you want it. Don't, don't laugh at me now. Laugh with me, please. Because I'm, I'm not alone in this, all right? But I understand that, and we understand that when you love somebody, when you really are devoted to somebody, there's nothing off the table. Everything is on the table. You know, sadly, we live in a world where we want to give our heart to things. We want to give our soul to a job. And we want to give our strength to what we think our future will be. And sadly, what has that produced in our world? It hasn't produced people that are so fulled up and so joyous and so happy. In fact, if we looked at the world and compared it to the purge and compared it to utopia, we would say they were closer to the purge than ever before. Why? Because people love things and use people. We are destroying the world with our very selfishness. And God's whole hope is he would give you this life. He would say, how should you use it? Love me. And I will use it to the best of his ability. But in this world, we've seen the destruction of what is selfishness. You know, I so appreciate it. It was so inspiring. We had our incredible campus devotional this past Friday. It was so awesome. And I want to lift up the brothers that preach, and that's Christoph, that's Jacob, that's Yusuf, and that is JP, who's in the North Valley. That's why I didn't remember his name. Amen? But it was so awesome. As Christoph preached, he gave this insight of this concept called Hellenism, which is something that Alexander the Great ushered in. He ushered in, and it was top four things. It was education, it was healthcare, it was athletics, and it was sports. Oh, I said that already. <laughs> Entertainment, that's what it was. Thank you, Ole. But he says here, as it teaches within that historical time, that people, instead of making God the center of their universe, just to let you know, us being Westerners, we don't understand that concept that God is the center, but an Eastern parts of the world, they already assume there's a relationship with God. For us in the Western world, we're trying to prove the existence and prove the relationship that we need it with God. But in the Eastern world, they, they flipped this upside down and made it more Western. They said, instead of God being the center of the universe, you're the center of the universe. Everything revolves around you. Don't give your heart to God, keep it to yourself. Don't give your soul to God, give it to other people. Don't give your strength and offer it to be glorifying God. Glorify your own name. 
This is now the world that we live in. So much so, not many people in this room are even batting an eye at that very concept. Why? Because the world has taught us that you got to get yours. That you've got to be the center because nobody else is going to take care of you. So much so we've created these idolatrous concepts called go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. We've created these concepts from this reality that, hey, I want to be the center. I want to be loved. I want to be taken care of. And we rivet all that attention away from God. And we wonder why we're still empty. You know, I think that for us as disciples, we have to focus on the fact that what brought us here was us devoting to God in this way. Falling in love with God in this way. You laid everything on the altar for God. Your heart, your soul, and your strength, nothing was pulled back. But because our nature is to not be on an altar, our nature is to not be self-sacrificing, we can slowly drift naturally into pulling all these things back. And instead of God being at the altar of our hearts, we have ourselves or something else that we desire. But I want to encourage us and challenge us in a great way that we need to be those that are crazy in love with God. Crazy in love. You know, I, I, I think it's so awesome when couples take the next step in their relationship and you really get to see them how in love they really are. And I'm so encouraged to be able to walk with Paco and Haley. It's so awesome. Because here's the thing. And this is the, that even saying here's the thing, that's Paco's thing. He, like, he loves the here's the thing. But Paco and Haley, they are crazy in love. I mean, if they could sing all the love songs in the world to each other, that wouldn't guard their heart, that wouldn't be good. But they would do it, amen? They would do it. You know, I, in fact, I, I got a couple things I got to talk to you about after this. No, I'm just saying. But they are crazy in love. And you can see it. Like, they don't have to look at each other for you to experience, like, a void of power between the two of them. Like, you walk around, you feel kind of weird being around. You're like, dang, like, I can feel your guys' love. Like, for you. should I, do you want me to leave? Like, you want me to step away? Can I be here? Is it okay? But should that not be the way our quiet times are? Where somebody doesn't feel fit to be in the presence of you when you're with your God? Maybe they feel that more when you're working at your job. Or you're with your significant other. Where you're so devoted to somebody else that they're like, man, I just don't feel like I should be. I feel like you're so focused right now. Shouldn't that be the way you devote yourself to God? You know, we should have an anthem in our hearts when it comes to us loving God. And I like music, and uh, I, you know, I, I listen to music. Femi accuses me of not listening to music often, and he's right. I don't listen to it while I'm driving. But at the gym, I listen to music, amen? I didn't listen to this song, but I do love music. It's just to prove the point here. But there's this song that I think should describe our love for God. And that's by a famous artist. Her name is Beyonce. And what it describes, this song is called Crazy in Love. I'm not going to sing it. But what I want to challenge us here this morning with is that should describe your relationship with God. You should be crazy in love, ready to offer your heart, your soul, and your strength to God because you're just so crazy in love with who he is. How do you fall crazy in love with God? How do you do this? Well, for our guests here, John 1.1 1, 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So if you don't know God's Word, then you don't know God. I want to challenge you, if you've never sat down and studied the Bible, I'm begging you, come in here. It's really awesome because now my heart is not searching for something to fill it up with. That God-sized hole filling it with temporary things, my heart is filled 
I have the love of God residing in my heart. And I guarantee you, look at the person that invited you out. They'll tell you the same thing. So I want to encourage you, study the Bible and figure out who is God. For the disciples, I want to challenge you. Same thing, John 1.1. Because it says when you are in God's word, you should be learning who God is. But not just about God. You see, I think we can learn the facts about somebody, but not really know who they are. You know what that means? You know them from a distance. I guarantee you, you can tell me the facts about uh, your favorite movie star right now. You can tell me the facts about your favorite sports team right now. You can give me all the stats right now. You can tell me all the stats, but it doesn't mean you know each individual player. You just know about who those people are. And I want to challenge us because in this time when you, I can sense the tiredness. I can sense it. You know what happens when you get tired? You want to start making shortcuts. To where your relationship with God becomes something you know about. You know about God, but you fail to continue to learn who he is. You start to know God from a distance. I want to challenge you, don't cut corners in your quiet times. Your quiet times are not just something you're held accountable for so you can tell your leader, oh, well, he's here. I'm studying out the first John, and I'm doing this, and I learned this, and I learned this fact about God, and the dates of the book is this, and then I da 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 That's not what your quiet times are for. Your quiet times are for you and your God to connect, to resolve, to transform within that time so you can go transform the rest of the world. Second point, look at 1 John chapter 4. Let's look at this John real quick. First John chapter 4. And just to give a little context about this book, this book was written to a group of disciples that were most likely in Asia Minor. And sadly, they were abandoned by a select group of high prominent, very powerful leaders that decided, you know what, the flesh is evil. And so you know what, God could not have possibly come down in the flesh because that's evil. And so we're totally disbanding away from this church. We're done being a part of the fellowship of believers. It's kind of weird that they would create their, then create their own fellowship, and they are still in the flesh. Pretty interesting backwards situation that we got going on here. But nevertheless, this is who it's written to. Because those who were left behind, John was writing to these disciples because they were so shaken up by the abandoning of these people and so what was his response as it says in first john 2 he says if they've gone out from you it's because they never belonged to you and so then he refutes how do you cope how do you deal how do you live in the midst of this very challenging existence in first john 4 and verse 7 it says dear friends let us love one another for love comes from god everyone who loves has been born of god and knows god Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. My second point, love each other. You know, this passage of scripture is so incredible because as we understand now who he's writing to and what he's fighting to accomplish them to see that, hey, in the midst of this challenge, in the midst of this strife, in the midst of the people that have abandoned the fellowship of God, don't worry. Focus on the one thing that matters. First off, Jesus Christ died for you to exemplify his love for us. And how do you then make that love complete in us? We love one another. 
And just as the apostle John wrote the book of John 13, he also wrote John 13, 34 to 35. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What separates us from the religious world and the world that they were in around them because they still had the Pharisees and different religious teachers of the time? What separates us? We love one another. You're like, yeah, I tell everybody I love them all the time. That's not what he's talking about. This is not an eros type of romantic love. This is not a phileo type brotherly companionship. This is agape. We will lay down our lives for one another. You see, the scripture teaches here is what would make the kingdom the kingdom of God? It would be that each individual was not in for their own selfish gain, but they would be wholly set apart from the world. They would be totally devoted to one another, just as Christ was devoted to us. He says, what would be the evidence? You would lay down your life, sacrificial love, where it's no longer about you, but it's about what you could do for your brothers and sisters. You know, I think it's amazing, as uh, Mike preached a couple weeks ago about Matthew 25 and the separation of the sheep and the goats. We understand that what would separate the sheep and the goats, he then goes on to explain in verses 34 all the way through that there's going to be two different responses. Then when Jesus comes back, he's going to say, hey, I'm going to look to a crowd, and I'm going to look to those that are the goats, I'm going to say, hey, when I needed this, and I needed this, and I needed that, you weren't there. And they're going to respond and say, what do you mean I wasn't there for you? What you didn't do for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you didn't do for me. And he's going to look to the sheep and he's going to say, hey, you did this for me. You did this for me. You did this. You laid down your life. And they're going to be so shocked. And I love in that passage of scripture how it explains that they were so shocked. You know why they were shocked? Because it was just the way they lived. They didn't keep a tally of what they did for each other because it was just like oxygen. It was the way that they lived and breathed. And what does he say? He says, whatever you've done for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done for me. You see, more and more as the Metro Coast continues to grow and we expand and we see numerical and geographical expansion, it's so awesome. But let us not lose the very foundation that has bonded us all together. We're family. We are actual family. If you're here with us this morning and you hear somebody say bro or sis, we're not just saying it because we're here in church. This is our actual family. But I want to challenge all of us here this morning to treat it like it is your real family. You know, I, uh, I think what can pull us back from being true family is fear. We can fear that we'll possibly be hurt by these relationships. We can fear that these relationships will be just like the relationships in the past. That they'll hurt us and there'll be no reconciliation. There'll be no just deep bitterness and turmoil within our hearts. That nothing will be different than the world. Why? Because you paint your future with your past. But here, what we learn from this is that things can be totally new within God's kingdom. But we fear because going to the depths and having a depth of relationships with somebody, it means you're totally vulnerable with them. It means you don't just know of them. You know who they are in their inmost being. They're in your life. Not just your mentor. Each brother and sister in the family of God. Everybody is so connected. But that produces a great fear when you've dealt with a lot of great pain. And I think that it's something I can relate to. I experienced a couple fears in my life. And um, I remember one time, I was 10 years old, and I, um, I was at the beach with my mom's friends. And my mom wasn't there, she was at work. My mom worked a lot. But... I was at the beach and I was swimming and it was awesome. We were at the beach, no floaties, you know what I'm saying? Like, bro, you know, I got no floaties, you know? <laughs> need, didn't need them. Um, but I walked out and I was in the ocean and it, it was, a, it was a, 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 the tide pulled me in 
I didn't have the I had feeble, feeble knees, you know. And it swept me in, and the undertow flipped me, and I was just in the ocean, and I would get up, smack by a wave, get back up, smack by a wave. And that day, I never knew that I would have the, on the um, menu that day, I would have sand. But I swallowed an immense amount of sand that day. And it, it felt like, you ever tried to swallow cinnamon? Yeah, well, that's what it felt like. It was terrible. Um, but you know what? The saddest part is nobody knew about it. I got back up like, praise God, I got out of there. And I walked back to the shore defeated. Just defeated. Like, like I couldn't even say, I couldn't, what am I going to tell him now? No, it's, it's over. I made it. And I was just exhausted. Whooped by the ocean. Whooped by the depths. I was like, I'm not doing that again. And I didn't know it, but subconsciously I made a covenant with myself that deep waters are not for me. Mm -mm. I didn't know that until a couple years ago we took our uh, ministry, our campus ministry up to Yosemite and we went to Lake Dana. And lakes are different than the ocean. They're super dark. Like they're, they're dark water. You can't see your hands. It's weird. And my wife is so daring. You know, she's, she's got a lot of faith here. I got to imitate that faith. Amen. Um, <laughs> But we were in the lake, and we were swimming out, and it was, it was cool. I was having a good time. She was like, we should swim to the middle. I was like, yeah, let's swim to the middle. Let's do it. I got this. Just me and my wife, dude, we're killing it. And as I'm swimming, suddenly a panic grips my heart, and I suddenly no longer want to be in water anymore. I suddenly want to run out of the water without being, I couldn't touch the ground anymore. And I was like, no, 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 no. I was like, get me out, get me out, get me out, get me out, get me out. And I got back and she was like, babe, what happened? I'm like, what? I was like, I don't know, I just, I'm not going back in. And I recognized that fear recently. And I was like, man, I got a fear of the water. I got a fear of going deep into the water where I can't touch the ground where I'm totally out of control. So I confessed it and I planned to face it. And so me and Jim have been going out each Friday to the ocean and swimming in the ocean. But let me tell you, everything in me was reluctant to go back into the depths. Why? Because I only remember drowning. I only remember fear. I only remember the pain I experienced, the exhaustion. And it is the same way I see that disciples can be within relationships in the kingdom. That when you want to go back into deep relationships, the only thing you remember is the hurt. You remember the depth and the lack of control and the pain and the experience. And everything is being painted with your past experiences. And so instead of facing that fear, you're reluctant to even go back into the water. And we fail to build deep relationships in the kingdom. And so we stay on the shore. And we have shallow relationships. You see here, John was trying to help them to see this is not the time to pull away from each other and get secluded. It's a time to bond with one another in an even deeper way. You see, I think that for us, we've got to challenge ourselves to not hold the brothers and sisters at an arm's distance. You know, there's a scripture in John 14, 8. It says, why are you like a stranger in the land, like a traveler who stays only a night? And I want to challenge the young Christians. There's a lot of young Christians that got baptized. And it's awesome. Let's give it up for our young Christians here. But I want to challenge you. Don't be like a stranger in the land. Like somebody who is only going to stay a short time. We can come into the kingdom and we're so freaked out by what people could possibly hurt us. Let me just, let me just demystify for you. You're going to get hurt. But the difference between being hurt in the kingdom and being hurt in the world is in the kingdom, we have, an, uh, we have a foundation of repentance and forgiveness. We actually reconcile with one another. But I want to challenge you, anytime I study the Bible with any individual, I say, hey, the people that actually make it to the end are those that actually make the kingdom their real family. How much I benefited from having uncles and older brothers and older sisters in the faith. Like, I, I, I found it that the closer I got to God's people, the more I learned about, wow, God accepted you. I can learn from you. You're different than me. Whoa, this is, and I learned and apply different things, and it's molded me into the man that I am. You see, the covenant you made with God is not just between you and God. The covenant you made with God is between you, God, and God's people. So love for God is exemplified by this, your love for one another. Your depth of relationship with one another. 
For the older disciples, as John's writing to those that had abandoned the fellowship, and I, I don't think any of our older disciples are amazing, but what we can do is because we've been in the kingdom very long, we've seen many people come and go. We've seen people walk away, many people. And you can start to harden your heart and be okay with just saying hey to that brother or sister and not really investing into those relationships. You know, for me, I, I came into the kingdom at 18 years old, and I had a father in the faith, Jason Dimitri. He's been in my life, and it's awesome. And I had Quaku, who's like a big brother, dad type figure. But you know what else? Now coming to L.A., I have more father figures and older brothers in my life. I got older brothers like Jesse. I got fathers like Michael and mothers like Sharon and my abuelo and abuela and Kip and Elena. And I have fathers like Jim and Donna. And I'm so grateful that these individuals are in my life because now they have swayed to disciple me, get involved in my heart, be involved, push me, and show me greater avenues that I could grow to because this is the family of God. You know, for this point, I, like I said, I love music. And so what song should be the song and the anthem of our relationships between each other? Well, Leona Lewis has a song, Bleeding Love. You've got to self-sacrifice for these relationships, and it may just take some blood so you can bleed for unity. Third point, look over at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35 says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You know, this is such a powerful passage of scripture as Jesus looks at the crowds and looks at all the known villages of the time. And he says he sees one thing, sheep without a shepherd, sheep without guidance. And it says in this translation, it says he was filled with compassion on them. In other translations, it actually says Jesus was moved with indignation. Moved with indignation and moved with compassion. How do these two reconcile? Well, Jesus was indignant towards the darkness of the world and compassionate towards the lost souls that were enduring that present darkness. You see, here Jesus, his response to the level of slavery that he saw was one of brokenness for those lost souls. He says, like sheep without a shepherd. You ever seen sheep without a shepherd, without their shepherd present? You look up videos. It's incredible. It's, it's hilarious. See, what happens is there's this video. It's really actually really funny. There's this wedge where this sheep and, her, and the, its hind legs are just like wiggling out. And it's got its butt out. And it's got legs it's like shaking and trying to move. And then the shepherd comes over and pulls that sheep out. And then you know what happens? You'd think the sheep like gets the lesson. Like it's like, yeah. Like, wow, thank you. It like runs and like prances. And then it like pops up like a bunny and jumps right back into the hole. Don't laugh, because that's us, all right? Because without Jesus being our guide, let me tell you what we do. We jump right back into the darkness. We're singing a song. We're not singing the songs of, of that need love for God. We're like, hello, darkness, my old friend. You're singing that song. But see, we are like sheep with a shepherd. And Jesus would call those that now have the shepherd to now look at the lost and be, see them as they really are. Sheep without the very gift they've been given. See, it produced so much that this impacted the spirit of Jesus Christ. So impacted the church. He then calls the 12 to be this compassionate. But look how it affects arguably the greatest Christian in history. Look at 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, and I love this, in the 2011 version of the Bible, it actually, in this section in verse 19, it says, Paul's use of his freedom, the freedom he had been given in Christ. How does he utilize it? It's going to be really 
interesting here. Verse 19, it says, though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I might share in its blessings. This is such a powerful heart that Paul exemplifies. He says, though I've been freed from my shackles of slavery, I take my shackles that were just broken and I hand them to God and say, use them as you please. I will devote my life not to just being that freed sheep that gets to just be the scapegoat and just run along and prance in the land. No, 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 no. I'm going to turn back and fight to free as many as possible. I will contort myself. I will change my character. I will change my mind. I will change my heart. If it means bringing one more soul in today, I will do whatever it takes. And I, I, I write this point simply because this has been the heart of the Metro Coast. Yeah. The Metro Coast has had a deep love for the lost. You tell me, with 97 baptisms so far, with eight restorations so far, with 48 place memberships so far, the Southland region started this year with 75 disciples. The Southland region now stands at 128 disciples. The West region started with 56 disciples, but now we stand at 85 sold out disciples. And what do the numbers mean? The numbers mean souls. Where would we be if we did not have Zachariah with us? Where would we be if we did not have Caden, who's in Oregon, about to baptize his mom? Where would we be without Brett over at LMU? Where would we be without Jordan at SMC? Where would we be without Karina at USC and Trey at USC? It's a deep love for the lost that has brought us this far. I want to challenge us. As it says in 1 Thessalonians, it says your work is produced by faith. But we understand from Galatians 5, the only faith that really matters is faith expressing itself through love. And immediately after that, in 1 Thessalonians, it says your labor prompted by love. What is the difference between work and labor? See, work has a finite amount of time. I work nine to five. But labor is indefinite. You see, labor, you can finish your job, but still working on learning how to do the job. That aspect is labor. See, for us, we have to understand, we work for the Lord every day. We're not saved by works, but we are saved to work. But we labor for the Lord until he comes back or to our life is no more. What produces that level of endurance is love. It's the decision to imitate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That even when he was exhausted, he was poured out, he had nothing left to give. He still decided to go on in ways. It'd be that love that is the exemplifying of our love for the lost. You know, I'm so excited to see the next 77 days of this year. You know why? Because it's an opportunity for us to save 77 more souls. It's the opportunity for us to be closer to God 77 more days in this year. It's an opportunity for us to give our treasures 77 more times. It's our opportunity to offer all of our talents on the altar of God 77 more times. It's our opportunity to love the lost 77 more days. Why do we do this? So that we may sing along with the lost souls that will sing the song as they come up on this stage. Maybe not reality, but in their hearts for sure. They'll sing the song by 
Etta James. At last, my love has come along. My lonely days are over, and life is like a song. Oh, yeah, yeah. At last, the skies above are blue. My heart was wrapped in a clover the night I looked at you. And we're not talking about each other. We're talking about God. We do this so that they can sing that anthem. After they say, Jesus is Lord, they come out of the waters of baptism being able to say, at last my heart is fulfilled. At last that empty part of my life has now been taken away by Jesus. We do this so that they can sing, at last I have found the most excellent way to God be all the glory.